Okay. <laughs> I think we should hand clap for we finally got the uh, PowerPoint up. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> okay. So um, I'm hoping that my um, partner will be here soon because actually some of the slides that are early on are tomorrow's. And so what I may be doing is mixing it up a little bit, and I'm sure you all don't mind. And basically, um, you got a great description. That was a description that was actually... Um, hopefully enticing you all to come to this presentation. And I think that what we're going to talk about is certainly things that you all are familiar with, right? Um, so it's going to be like nothing that's really going to be news to anyone sitting in this room. It's just that we have an opportunity in this room to come together to really discuss some of our challenges and really look at some of the realities that are there presently for where is there, where are we, right? Where are we now with equity? Um, where are we with equity when we, when, it turns, when we talk about gender? And really, what do we really mean when we talk about bias? So I wanted to also take a few minutes in this to talk about bias, because we hear it all the time, we're doing trainings for that, and really having an understanding of what we mean by that terminology. So um, basically, those are the objectives that we hope to cover, as I'm really kind of go through um, not uh, so much detail about bias, because sometimes I get too deep into the science, I can't help myself about our brains and how it works and all of that, but <laughs> really I think it's helpful to understand some of the science of it so that you can get to understand that, you know, really why does this happen when really we have all these other intentions, right? Because we all have other intentions and still it happens. And so that's what we have to know about what implicit bias is or unconscious, and I'm going to go through that a little bit. Um, when my associate gets here, she's going to talk a little bit more about equity in the workplace. I'm going to talk about from my perspective and what I do. Um, and we're, she's also, we have statistics for gender equity, which I can go through. Um, awareness of some of the impact of gender on workplace um, advancement and career navigation. Um, what kinds of things happen. And really for you to kind of think about things that you're doing. Uh, things that have been challenges, and really to kind of leave with some personal strategies or thoughts. I think from awareness and reflection, and then really looking at your organization. If you are a leader in your organization, looking at your organization and saying, where is it there may be that there's some bias there in our policies or what we're doing that we need to reevaluate? And really that self-reflection and awareness is really a key, key, key thing when we think about bias. So. Why is that glass ceiling the wrong metaphor when we think about navigation and with, with gender um, and with women in particular for what happens for us on trying to, you know, ascend the corporate ladder and get to that C-suite, they call it, or the um, higher promotion? Why is that the wrong way to look at it? What does a glass ceiling imply? I always like to ask, ask questions. I think it's, um, <laughs> I think it's been Of it, which isn't really what your career is just about. Um, yeah, that's the way I would take that. Thank you for sharing. Anyone else? Yes? Well, I think the glass ceiling is like a static marker, and if you break that, all's good. But it's not a static marker, it's a moving target. Absolutely, yes. I think it also gives the wrong impression that if one person makes it to wherever this goal is, and everybody else should be able to meet it Yes, absolutely. I mean, that's an unfair um, way to look at it. Absolutely, thank you. Anyone else? Did you raise your hand back there? Or you were just, you, you don't have anything? You, okay, I'm, I won't put you on the spot. Okay, so basically when we think about a glass ceiling, right, and this is really a metaphor that probably you've heard a lot, it's really that it's a top down, that there's something that's this barrier that you know, we can see, but for some reason we can't break through. And really, all of us in this room know that the challenges are really more like walls, right? And when you think about a labyrinth, it's the walls, like, you know, there's like you go through one entrance and then there's this wall or this challenge and you go through another and there's another challenge. So it's certainly not top down. It's more bottom up, but also it's really navigating to kind of get to where you're going and really what are those barriers along the way. So that glass ceiling metaphor is really out of favor, and it's one that we're, that's actually you're going to see less and less in literature, and more and more they describe it as a labyrinth or other ways of saying bottom up. And that's the reason. The reason is, is really when we think about all of the things that you have to navigate in your career path, you know, to actually get to promotions, even from start, you know, actually navigating to actually get the job. 
the beginning of getting the job, getting promoted on the job, and then going to the different levels. It's all these different blocks or barriers that you can run into. So again, that is why, and thank you for everyone who shared, why the glass ceiling is not the appropriate metaphor. So um, we were going to just do, I just always like an agenda too, kind of had the objectives. But the agenda is that we were going to kind of go over um, bias, which I'll do, and statistics. I'm hoping that tomorrow will come in for more of the statistics. We were going to have a fireside chat um, between the two of us, but we want to welcome you all to join us. So I have some questions for her in her uh, field, and she has some questions for me and mine for us to actually talk about some of the things that have worked for us, lessons learned, some of our challenges for you all to kind of participate in. And then there's a diet exercise that's embedded in the PowerPoint that I'm going to have you all do diets to kind of have the con conversations to be able to talk about your challenges. We'll have a large group debrief, and then we'll have a wrap up where you kind of have some reflections and thoughts that you're going to go forward with after this meeting. So this is Demara's part. I'm going to try to do it. But this is sort of like what we call an icebreaker. So have you ever, and you can just like raise your hand or just, you know, if you want to say something, felt that your, your accomplishments weren't recognized. Okay. Have you ever been in a situation where you felt a man received credit for an idea that you shared earlier? Okay. Have you ever noticed that female job candidates are being evaluated more harshly than males? Have you ever received feedback that you have sharp elbows? <laughs> yeah, okay. Or you need to tone it down. Have you ever received feedback that you should show more confidence uh, or that you lack the executive presence? Have you ever experienced both of these um, pieces of feedback in the same job? <laughs> Have you ever been called that you're too direct or pushy? are aggressive. That's never happened to me, but yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, and felt like women are more critical of one another? No, oh, okay. Okay. Um, felt, that, uh, felt that people question your commitment to your job after you've had children. Or that people have directly or indirectly suggested that you should work fewer hours. Or have you felt that your status as a mother negatively impacted a job interview or performance review? Okay. Um, now raise your hand if you do not have children. Keep your hand up if you worry that you will be perceived differently in your job if you do have children. Or that people will assume you will have children and it will affect your work. Okay. So uh, these are just some statistics that it will take 250 years, these are like some sobering statistics, for women to catch up in the Fortune 500 companies with males. Um, women um, have great, made great strides in the 90s, but the progress has leveled off mostly um, since then. Uh, women are far less likely than men to go after certain roles, and it's due to them not having all of the perceived qualifications. Uh, women make 82%, I've actually even seen, seen less than that, um, depending on um, the organization and field, um, to, that, to the dollar that men make in nearly all two, 350 occupations. Compared to white males with the same education, black and Latino women with only a bachelor's degree have the largest gap at 63% to the dollar for pay even with advanced degrees. Um, women are promoted to manager at far lower rates than males. Um, women of color account for only 4% of C-suite um, leaders in the country. And in February 2021, women's labor force participation rate was 55.8%, so more women are actually in the labor market, yet um, in the same report, um, women of color and those working in low-wage occupations have been most impacted. But really what this statistic, too, is like even though women now make the majority of working, people that are working, 
And so the, to see the lower numbers of women that are in the CEOs or leaders of companies, like it's only like 5%, doesn't make sense because you are outnumbering really males actually in the workplace. So there are other things that must be operating that, may, that lead to where we're seeing these differences are what we call disparities in leadership roles and professional attainment in those leadership CEO positions and organizations for women. Um, women with children were 79% less likely to be hired and only half as likely to be promoted. Um, and they were offered, again, half average of $11,000 less in salary and held to a higher performance standard than their identical um, other women without children. And in this past year, one in three women has considered leaving the workforce or down downshifting their career. Uh, these are other statistics that are kind of sobering. 42% of women experience gender discrimination at work. In 2017, 25,000 sex-based discrimination claims were filed. In 2018, victims of sex discrimination received more than $148 million in payouts. And five of the 14 top barriers women face in the workplace are related to discrimination and to gender bias. Both men and women are twice as likely, this is something that surprised me, but m both men and women are twice as likely to hire a male candidate rather than a woman candidate. And women are 79 times more likely to be hired when there are more than one female candidate that's applying for the job. And women are 25 to 46 percent more likely to be hired when they have blind auditions or blind applications. So that's something we'll talk about with mitigation and things that we can do. We've kind of already talked about pay raises or less. There are 23 percent of CEOs are women. Only 4 percent of those C-suite roles are held by women of color. 6.6 percent of CEOs, uh, uh, CEOs at Fortune 500 companies are women and 0.2% of CEOs at Fortune 500 companies are women of color. Half of men believe women are well represented at their company when 90% of senior leaders are males. 40% of men and women notice a double standard against female candidates. Men view unconscious bias as the number one barrier women face in their careers. And 34% of men and women believe male executives are better at risk assessment. Men are 30% more likely to obtain managerial roles. And women and men ask for pay raises at the same rate. OK, so I think when um, Damara gets here, we'll have a little bit more opportunity in our fireside chat to talk about some of those statistics that I just read out um, to have it more engaging. But to talk about bias, first of all, when you think about bias, most of you think bad, right? That's usually the thought. Most of the time when you hear the word bias, our thought runs to bias is something that's bad, it's negative, it's something that actually causes a problem and difference and disparities and all these things that we hear. I just want to say that at the beginning, first of all, bias is a neutral term. It's a neutral term. Bias means that you just have a preference for something. Something, of, uh, something of, of there's something you have a preference for, a person or a group or something. That's all the term really means. But when we talk about bias, we talk about the different types of bias. And conscious bias or explicit bias you are consciously expressing something that you prefer. So for example, I have a closet full of black clothes. <laughs> like coming here to you know, do this presentation, I'm like, what am I gonna wear? Oh, black suit. Because I tend to prefer, and it's conscious on my part, I buy black dress, at least your dress, is, I'm gonna want it in black. I have like maybe two or three other dresses, it's a shame to say, in my closet that are, are another color. And the reason I bought the other color was because somebody else was with me and said, you need to buy it in a different color. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's just an example of conscious bias. I'm conscious of it. I know it's something I select on purpose. And I just like it. I just like all black looks. I don't know. It's something. So that's conscious. And it's conducted with that intent. Now, the opposite of conscious is unconscious. And that's what we hear the other word is implicit.
And those are things that I may have um, learned as part of things that I've been exposed to, and all of us have been exposed, we've all been socialized. We have all have a culture, we all have families, we all have exposure, we've all looked at TV, we've all gone to movies, we all have magazines. There are things that have, we've absorbed, right? And things that actually have absorbed in us as uh, something that we then are making a decision about unconsciously, our thoughts about. So it has an unconscious effect on our behavior or our thoughts that we're not consciously aware of. And the most important part about that is they may be actually in direct conflict to your conscious preference and intent. So then when we talk about really what's wrong in bias, what's the negative result of bias, it's that. It's that when there's those automatic associations that I've made that I'm unaware of that have been influenced by culture are some things that you know are uh, that we see and we hear or whatever things that have influenced us that make us behave or act in a way that's contrary to our conscious beliefs and our conscious you know what we actually what we just went through so it's opposite to what my conscious expression of what I want to do. So that's what happens with unconscious. It can automatically slip, seep in, and that's basically where we see the problems with disparities. The disparities that we see, we hear about with healthcare, and we hear about with groups. Now, some of it's a conscious. You know, there are some conscious people, just real conscious, that I don't like this kind of group of person, whatever. But a lot of that it can be unconscious. And so we really have to think about ways that that can change when we're thinking about strategies to make a difference with what we're seeing as a result of bias. And we're talking about today um, gender bias. And in gender bias, what is that? It's actually that tendency to prefer one gender over another gender. And it's, and it's a form usually most often is unconscious. So we don't want to think that people consciously, again, it can be, but we don't really want to think necessarily that it's on a conscious level. It's just the way things have been. It's just the way that you know, people think. It's just automatic. And some of the things that have been automatic and the way that we've, you know, stereotyped for women, stereotyped for men, okay? So it actually is a form of unconscious bias, can be conscious, or implicit bias. And it occurs when one individual unconsciously attribute certain attitudes, and I said stereotypes, right? Attitudes and stereotypes to another person or group of people. These, uh, these behaviors affect how that person understands and engages with others. Now, you know, another important part about that and understanding is that any bias, and particularly when we're talking about gender bias, there's intersectionality. Sometimes it gets really like hard to separate it out. So for example, as a female leader, I'm a you know, dean, associate dean in the, in the uh, medical school. I'm also black. So I'm a black woman that's an associate de dean. So that's an intersectionality. I'm also older. So I'm also older than some of the other women that are working in the, you know, that I work with. So it could be my age, it could be my gender, it could be that I'm black. So there's this intersectionality of things that happen for bias, and we have to understand that too. I could have a different ability level or a sexual orientation that I may have you know, to tell, to, you know, uh, let people know. And so all of those things can be intersectionality of which can then enact and actually have bias come out against you. And it's hard to separate it out. Sometimes for me, the challenge has been when there's challenges, is it because I'm um, black and, or, and a woman or just because I'm a woman in this spot or is it because I'm older, you know, in this spot? You know, it's like that challenge of trying to figure it out. It's exhausting, right? It can be exhausting. But it's just to understand that that concept, there are many different levels to it and it really is really hard for all of us on, you know, because we all have intersectionality. And kind of like I alluded to this already about when bias really becomes a concern, because we know that bias is something all of us have. It has no, it's a neutral term, right? But we have to understand when is it not good? And that's you know, where our brain goes. It's not good when it becomes 
something that's negative in the stereotype or the way that we act with people that causes them to be treated unfairly or to actually be discriminated against. That's when bias is really a concern. And that's why we need to uncover it and understand it if it's indeed unconscious. We need to find ways to uncover it, make people aware for change to be able to happen. So that's when bias is really a concern and that's what we hear about and read about and need to really kind of understand. I promise to do short on the science. <laughs> so the science of uh, bias, um, again, people are like, how could that happen? Because um, I, you know, I, I really, you know, I, I don't believe that about myself. Have any of you all ever done anything called an IAT? You know, the implicit association test is out by Harvard. You've done it? Okay. And what did you do it on, if you don't want my sharing? Okay. What, did it, the results surprise you at all? Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. it felt like I was just tell what it was asking, but um, it does surprise me because even though I feel like it's that conscious versus unconscious. Yes. So yes. I think I think that then how I respond. Exactly. Yeah. So the IAT, and those of you all that aren't familiar, I usually suggest that's something to do. I'm um, going to talk more about that if we get to our fireside chat because I did one before this that I hadn't done before. But the IAT is a test that's used in a lot of companies. It's used in education, it's used in policing to actually uncover your unconscious. And basically when you do put too much thought in it, then what it's actually showing you is conscious. Because I'm really thinking about how I'm pressing those keys and making those associations. I'm no longer testing unconscious. I'm now gonna get no surprise because it's really, it concurs with what I consciously believe about people. So it really is important that you take the test like it is, and I just suggest to take it on gender, because I found it very interesting. I'll share my results. I had not done the one on gender before today. But basically what happens in our brain is, first of all, our brain is pretty amazing, right? We actually, on any one given moment, we're processing, this actually astounds me every time I look at the statistic, about 11 billion bits of information at any one moment we're processing, wow. Right? But we're really only aware of about 40, about 40 bits of information consciously. But we are processing on a regular 11 billion bits of information. That's like amazing. So you can just imagine some of that stuff, all that stuff we're processing, where is it going? It's going kind of into our automatic, right? Going into our unconscious. There are things we learned how to do, like get in the car, turn on the key, stop at the red light, whatever. Not thinking, well, maybe you should think about the red light. <laughs> but I mean, <laughs> I used to use that as an example too. <laughs> but actually, you know, there are things like that, right? That you think about that you just kind of don't think about because it's automatic. But it's there because, you know, you processed and it's all this information, you just know how to do it and you just boom, 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 done. And then that the things that you were consciously have to think about at any one moment. So that's our brain on a regular, right? And so that's what happens. We, in order to make sense of this world, of all these complex things in the world, right? We categorize. We put things into categories. So our brain does that for us. We categorize, we do generalizations, and that helps us to kind of like make sense of things that we're doing at that time. So for example, um, I'm a physician and one of the things for me, for us is in the healthcare is that all the different diagnoses it could be, right? So it's sort of like we categorize a lot. So like here you come in with chest pain, I'm like, okay, I have to think about the heart and the lungs, the different things. And start categorizing based on different pieces of information and come up with what we think is wrong. All of us do that with what we're doing. So that's our brain. So we're doing that and we're making sense of the world. We're processing all this stuff all the time and just think about it when you are tired you've read about 100 emails already and you're only like 11 o'clock instead of not even noon right so all the emails that you've read you've been to like i don't know how many zoom meetings already before noon right so meetings emails things that you've had to do for your job um you know things you have to write things you have to present all those things that you have been doing and you can't get lunch because now you've just been so busy and you really don't have time. So I gotta keep going because I don't wanna leave at 7 p.m. 
when I really should be leaving at 5, but really I never leave at 5 because it's at 7 p.m. is really my day. It's 12 hours, right? I'm just saying, this is, think about it, right? Can you all feel me? Okay. <laughs> I'm sure you can feel me. And then you get home and you want to eat, and then it's like, do I have to look at emails still before tomorrow? Right? Or there's work I still have to do before tomorrow, right? So this is what we're doing. We're doing that, and just imagine the load. So that's a cognitive load. All that information we're, pro pro you know, we're processing, you know, all this stuff. And so now something comes at you that's different, you know, or that you have to deal with. But I haven't had lunch. I'm processing. All this stuff is happening. And so my mind is going to go to the general thing to think of. And I'm just going to say that's what the problem is and, and move on, right? Or something automatic is going to come out. That's when it comes out. So that I'm just kind of giving you when more likely, so stress, that overload, all of those times is when more likely that we're going to go to what we're familiar with, what kind of helps us, what those generalizations are, what those stereotypes may be, and some of those may be those ones that are not good. And I may just go to it. And women, I will tell you the example for women, particularly in medicine, chest pain. Women come in with chest pain. And the thought is like, okay, well, women, they complain. Their, chest, their pain is actually, they're not, you know, they, their pain is really not as bad as they're, they're saying, right? Maybe not as bad, and I don't think it's heart disease. It may be something more stress-related or something. Fact, facts. So what happens is women are more likely missed that have heart attacks or cardiac infarctions because, again, it's the thought of where th maybe you go to to think about not going to think about that maybe this is the first thing I want to think about, is this an MI? So again, so trying to unpack that and understanding. And when you see and read some of those disparities, I'm giving you the reference for me, but when you read some of those differences, that's kind of like when it's going to happen, more likely. Not that that person hopefully is intentional, but that's when it's more likely to happen and the go-to. Okay, so just that's our brain, what can happen. And there's this stereotype application. So that stereotype application of those expectations of that group and those expectations of that person, right? They kind of go into that processing at that time, more likely that then it's going to come out with a negative. So that's kind of like our brain, you know, just kind of understanding the science of how this can happen. And those key points that I wanted to kind of go over again is that it's something that is automatic. It just happens, it's unconscious. It's activated sometimes without our awareness. That's why we have to be understanding about that. You know, we have to think about times when we're stressed, think about, you know, ways that we can do things differently, think about what may be happening that, you know, other people are processing and maybe that's why they have this, their, their, um, their policies the way they are or something. Right? So that out of their control, our awareness is pervasive. Just want to get it out there. All of us have it. You know, we all have bias. Um, it's not always going to align with what we explicitly think. And it can have those real world effects on our behavior. And that's where we really want to be able to recognize, become aware, because we do want to change those, particularly if it's causing harm to someone. If it's causing what I said, the concern, because now there's inequity in pay. There's inequity in jobs. There's inequity in the way that you actually get promoted. Those kinds of things that are happening. And the last line is super important, is that it's malleable, you know? So it is something that, yes, it's just not, okay, well, that's just the way that it is. No, it's something that can change. So it's malleable. Um, and people have to want to do it. We have to unlearn it. We have to know become aware and we have to know ways that we can become aware and things that we can do to make that change happen. The stereotype application, if, any, if this is familiar to you all, for women versus males, you know, and particularly when we're looking at um, leadership and leadership ca uh, characteristics, women are thought of more as communal in their characteristics. That we're softer, we're soft-spoken, we usually convey more concern, we're more compassionate. These are kind of, we treat people with kindness first, we're more affectionate, we're helpful, we're friendly, we're more sympathetic, 
we, w we want to make these interpersonal you know, connections and really want people to feel okay. And we really want everybody to feel good that works with us. And male is the agentic characteristics that are, they, they're assertive. We expect that. They are, they are controlled, they are under control. They have it under control. Aggressive, ambitious, they have dominant, they're more self-confident, forceful, self-reliant, and individuals, and then individualistic. So if those are like the characteristics that are associated, and think about it, when does those things start happening? When you're a baby, right? When you're young, right? This is what girls do. <laughs> so it's sort of like that's the characteristics. Remember I tell you about society and the culture. Now things are changing, but still there are these statistics that I just you know, told you all about that show that things are still not where we want them to be, right? So we have to kind of understand this. I have to also understand that if these are the characteristics that people are associating with, a fem you, know, with you as a female, um, and now I'm looking for hiring somebody to be the leader of this organization. I want somebody that's going to be assertive, self-confident, right? Convey authority. And I just, and if I have in my, my brain that women are not like that, right? That they are more, you know, softer or, or more, you know, less, less, less aggressive. And on the other hand, even women will think that way about other women, right? So I don't know if any of you all can think about that, you know, women that are leaders that you may work with, right? Um, I know I'm guilty. I tend to have a more soft-spoken, whatever kind of manner, and not now. I'm actually becoming better. I'm becoming, becoming a little bit more outspoken. But there's, a, you know, leaders that I work with uh, currently that's very, like, assertive and very open and just very, and I'm like, oh, my God. You know, how can they be, how can she be that way? I've said that. You know, um, something that was a revelation for me when I actually did the I add on gender, a really a, what I, and I had to reflect on it. So just understanding that's a stereotype application. That's actually the, the, the characteristic traits that are associated that then carry over and have carried over, particularly when we're talking about the Fortune 500 companies, organizations that, you know, that we know of, that where they're all still male-dominated leaderships. That's, that's why that labyrinth is really so was harder to na to navigate um, there are four bias patterns that women face in the in the uh, workplace and those are prove it again um, tightrope there's a tightrope again that tightrope I kind of said is you're judged by women and you're judged by men if I'm too aggressive or too assertive you know, it, it, it may be that people aren't going to like me and I may not actually get, you know, to be, you know, the leader that I want to be or get that position. So there's like this tightrope that you're actually trying to balance. There's the maternal wall, that expectation, again, with that stereotype that, you know, more likely that women are going to have a conflict when it comes to work versus family life. And that conflict more likely is an assumption, you know, that maybe that assumption, even just entering in the job, and that, that will interfere with your mobility up because you're perceived to like you're not going to really stay. You're not going to, you know, you may leave for you know, time and you're not going to be as committed to actually the position. And it's sort of like this tug of war. So these are the bias patterns that women actually face on the regular in the workplace. And the top issues I've already mentioned is really pay inequality. Uh, pay inequity. 80% of what men are paid, that's still current. Um, sexual harassment, females are more likely to be sexually harassed on the job. The statistics are sobering, actually. 70% to 79% of women have reported that they've been sexually harassed on the job. Racism is also part of the challenge. Um, Promote it less often, and promote it less often because of some of the things, the applications that, you know, I just talked about, that stereotype patterning and that, that thought. And also, even when you get the job, actually advocating for yourself for the top pay. So that fear, is like, I got the job, and I don't want to ask for too much because, again, I don't want to lose the job or think that I want them to think I don't want the job. That actually literally happened to me with the job I applied for. Um, in the before coming here. When I asked for like the pay and wanted more pay, it was sort of like the whole thing changed. 
And it was, I couldn't understand it. But I was advocating for myself for pay. And I knew, I understand it now, but at the time I was like, oh my God, I lost a job, you know, because I asked for more money. Um, when really, in reality, uh, they were underpaying me for the role that I was going to have. So, I feel better about it now. <laughs> the other thing that happens is this. You know, it takes a toll. Imagine, and, you, and I know you all can, imagine the daily, daily, that this happens, or you know, the frustrations and all that. It can happen to affect your health, your physical health, headaches, chronic stress causes chronic illnesses, um, uh, a lot more likelihood to have depression, um, anxiety, doubt, some of those things that actually creep in to actually affect your physical well-being. And that physical well-being then is going to affect your performance. And it's a vicious cycle because if you're feeling that pressure and you keep feeling that pressure and there's no relief, and unfortunately, just like I shared with you all, I went to that it had to be something I did wrong, right? So something I did wrong for asking for more money in that job, just as that example. And then it's like, maybe I shouldn't do that. It's that anxiety that builds up. And then it's, and you know, you're working and you're trying to still do your best. And we're performing, trying to do 100% or 150%, you know, just to kind of like stay afloat. It affects you. It can affect your, um, your health in very negative ways. So um, when Damara gets here, hopefully she will get here, we're going to do the fireside chat. But at this point, what I think I'm going to do is go to the discussion questions to have you kind of like f uh, do two by twos, dyads, to kind of discuss. Um, these are the questions. One is, I want you to talk to each other about areas that you think are walls that maybe that you've experienced or you can think of that people experience um, in their uh, navigating that career leadership roles. The second question is, um, can you think of areas in your workplace where gender bias may have played a role? I've given you some um, examples for myself. Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. I'm so sorry that we don't, we ran out of time, time because- We literally only have like five more minutes with you. Is yeah. that you, Kathy? Yeah. Hi, Kathy. How are you? So this is Tamara, everyone. I am so sorry, you all. I had a speaking engagement <laughs> right before this speaking engagement that ran like over, and it was bur and so I'm just I'm so sorry, but I'm I know that you are in really great hands with Dr. Dixon, right? Just give it up for Dr. Dixon. Yeah. She's, like, <laughs> she's so dope. So I'm. No. A, I'm a, <laughs> yeah, that's a colloquial wasn't I use often. Um, so I'm going to just debrief with you all to give let her rest a little bit considering we were going to co-facilitate this space so what came up for you in your conversations regarding action what kind of action do you feel compelled to take based on all this good content that was shared with you today yeah well i'm going to say we were talking and we're obviously different ages um <laughs> and what i experienced like some major um discrimination you know being told why should i hire you you're going to get pregnant and quit um versus she's never experienced and isn't aware of some of the stuff that she's probably been subjected to. So it becomes like, my generation it was out in the open, you know? It yeah. Was, like, now it's so much more hidden that mm -hmm. it, it's easier to think it doesn't exist and that worries me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's certainly, I mean, you're right, it's a lot more subtle and what I would say is I have, a, there's a friend of mine that's local who is, and I think it depends on position as well because if you're becoming a CEO, let's say, there may be more things that are talked about about what you can and cannot do, which is acceptable. And some things that I was told that were told to her about what she could and could not do regarding motherhood, regarding a lot of things. And so you think, oh my God, it's, you know, we're, we're talking about 2021, this kind of thing doesn't happen, but it still happens. And women will often, if they really want to go down that career track, they may, make that choice, choose the career track over motherhood. And the beautiful thing about being a woman, we have a whole myriad of choices, right? Um, but to be told that this is, this is the limitations that we're putting on, your, on you if you want this role, it, you know, it, it still happens. So thank you for shedding light on that, that intergenerationally it could show up differently. What else came up in terms of action? What else? I know you feel compelled to do something. Lindsay? Um, I know for me, um, I mean, it really could change because of gender bias, I felt. 
uh, where I was doing the work, every all my coworkers were like, you deserve this promotion, and I kept asking and asking for it, and I feel out of control, and maybe intimidation, it kept getting pushed back. Yeah. And so it was time to make a change, and it was like, don't even bother countering. Like, I, you know, it's like where you just have to make that. And then to come to a new culture where you don't even feel that just really validates your own worth. I think that's been the biggest thing is not sacrificing my authenticity because someone's intimidated by me. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, and this nice. Is so good because in the research I like that. that um, we, you know, we were, I was going to talk a lot more about in the slides some of the ways that we we are told to strategize actually kind of perpetuate some of this stuff, right? And so there's such a fine line between um, being able to say for yourself, this is what it's gonna be and this is how I'm gonna show up. You know, the talk I did before today was on, um, before I showed up today was about burnout culture. Mm -hmm. Well, we know 70% of organizations don't support us regarding our wellness, but what power do we have? So when we're talking about gender bias, what power do we have to interrupt things so that we're not taking action that is gonna make it hard, not just for you, but for any woman that's in the workplace, mm -hmm. right? So, but it's really beautiful when we can be in an environment that prizes that. Mm -hmm. um, and there's even, a, there's a story that where a young woman, just starting off her career, she was sexually harassed several times. And then when we talk about some of the intersectionalism, like if you show up and you have a certain gender expression, you may be more of a target. So keeping in mind that intersectional lens and how that may show up for different people is really important, right? It's not enough for us to say that, you know, women make 74 cents to the dollar when we know that black women make 64 cents to the dollar, right? So we want to make it make sense so that we have an appreciation for everybody's experience. Yeah, so thank you so much for that. What else? We've got time for... Turn your mic off. Turn my mic off? On. on. Can you hear me now? I figure I'm so loud that I you don't need it, but okay. you All right, I'm such a rule breaker. All right, so what else um, came up for you in terms of action? What do you feel inspired to do? Yeah. So I attended the imposter syndrome um, topic this morning, so this kind of all correlates. And so what it makes me think of is to speak up. And when we were talking. Um, my partner here uh, mentioned that when she was in banking, when somebody came in, they always assumed the man in the room was the manager. So I think that just like we said earlier this, mor in the, this morning's uh, imposter syndrome, is speak up and say, no, this lady is the manager. The, you know, so we speak up and we back each other up mm -hmm. a little bit more. Um, so we can start to break that bias. Yeah, mm -hmm. that was mm -hmm. one of the things that mm -hmm. really resonated with me a lot. Um, and I think that's probably where we have the greatest opportunity to create more solidarity um, within, because, you know, as I was talking about within any kind of cultural change that we're attempting to create, it's one thing, we know one person can change an institution. We know that, one idea can. But when there's a collective, when people have been talking mm -hmm. about their experience, and they're saying, this, these are the things that we want to change within this respective environment, or you're championing for a woman and you're you know, leading that, somebody else is witnessing that, right? And so it really does, because we do have group think. We do care what our peers think about us, even people who say they don't care. Everybody cares to a certain extent. Everybody's gonna be influenced to a certain extent by their peers. And so if you can do that and bring women together, there's so much power in that, not just for you, and it'll make you, you feel better in the environment, but it also has the power to really change your institution. So I think we've got time for maybe one or two more before we wrap up. What else came up in terms of action, ladies? Well, I'll share. Everybody feels a little bit different, but Hi. <laughs> um, I tend to be more masculine to the feminine, and so I'm reflecting on, and you kind of talked about this, but is this something that is truly innate in me, that that's just who I am, or is this a learned behavior that, because I saw that as a positive route, that, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know, like I'm still sitting with that, so I think that's something I'll personally be reflecting on. Yeah. Perfect. And I think it's a good invitation for all of us, right? Because no matter what gender we identify with, we have masculine and feminine energy that's always interplaying. And what I'm really loving, I'm loving seeing women really embody their femininity in 
um, in power roles, right? Because it used there was a time when you what you know you got the um, the shoulder pads and you, you wore the pants. And I love a great pantsuit, but is there? But it's really about like what is the reasoning behind? Is this really who I am, or am I trying to show up and be something? Because this is the reality. We have to live with ourselves at the end of the day. And I say to clients all the time, I'm not going to tell you to do anything. You get to decide everything. But the question becomes, can you live with it? And what parts of yourself might you be giving away within the slippery terrain that you're trying to navigate through? You know, Because sometimes we think, oh, well, we've arrived, right? Because maybe we were one of the ones that had enough masculine energy to make it happen. We were strong enough to make it happen. We were. And so even prizing some of those softer skills in the workplace, which we know are really important, because men also have social and emotional skills. We talk about men as if they don't. <laughs> but the research, we do, we yeah. do, right? But the difference is, is that men have social and emotional intelligence in ways that we don't, and we have it in ways that they don't. So a lot of times we, we create this separation, but we could learn a lot from men and their social and emotional intelligence and how they use it. And, and they can learn a lot from us in terms of how we use it to effectively connect and engage and et cetera, et cetera. So I just think the invitation for us all is to examine all of it, right? Um, and then to create your own vision about how do you want to show up as a woman in the workplace for you and the kind of leader that you want to become, but also the kind of leader that you are working to inspire in other women. And my sister right here will have the very last word. No. <laughs> I am more masculine than feminine in a lot of my roles and tomboyish and everything. And as a manager through most of my life, I have been told I'm not warm and fuzzy enough, I don't have the personal skills, I'm too bossy, I need to like tone it down, I'm intimidating. I mean, all of those things that you, if I were a man, I would never hear. Exactly. No man has exactly. ever told you need to be more warm and fuzzy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> more warm and fuzzy. Right? And so I think that, I, I love what you're saying because I think the invitation is for us to different, uh, differentiate between is this the kind of leader that I really want to be, right? And if the, the kind of leader that you want to be is the kind of leader that does have those kind of characteristics, then leave the hell out of that world, well, right? But if, but if you are deciding that you want to be softer, you want to be more of a connector, you want to be more engaging in the workplace. You also have that opportunity to do that too, right? Because you can choose all of it. So I would invite us to really be critical in our analysis about the information that we've been fed to tell us a story because this is, this is the thing. We've absorbed everything that we know, we've absorbed it somewhere else. And the only way that you can interrupt that is by deciding for yourself who you are and how you want to show up and begin to take a line action to get you there. Dr. Dixon, anything final? No, just actually, I really appreciate you all's um, patience with us and actually your participation. I love the fact that you all were so into this conversation. And actually, you see, this could be a much longer conversation, right? <laughs> we could certainly go on for like another half an hour or so, and I really wish we had more time. Because uh, we could do like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so maybe we'll actually we come back and do it. Yeah, yeah we will. Day. Yeah, so thank you for your time. Thank you for your participation. Just thank you for who you are and just, you know, thank you. <laughs> All right, these so are these just are some tips. Okay. Yep, go ahead. Yeah, these are just some practical things that you can do. So please take a picture of it. We wanted to leave you with 10 things that you can put into action right away yes. as you decide if you wanted to do that. Um, Dr. Dixon and I will be available after. And I'm glad I got a little bit of time. <laughs> Me too. Of time. All right, have a wonderful Wait, day. Thank right. you. Thank you so much, Shara, and tomorrow for the very insightful session.